Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous sign you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born again when he is whole? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are an Israel teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. <laughs> Pastor is coming to deliver the message. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Robbie. Hi. I'm Peter this morning with you folks. Thank you for that music, worship team. But we are missing sticks. <laughs> Yes, sure. Lord willing, sticks will make it back for next week. All right. All right. And, how, and how's uh, sticks doing? He's doing well. He's We're doing hard well. and having fun. Okay. That's Eddie, if you don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, a change of season is upon us. Definitely, I pulled out the old warm, snuggly sweater. <laughs> You know it is warm in here, that's for sure. And it's going to get a lot warmer once I start talking. <laughs> Unfortunately for you folks, I forgot my glasses, so I can't see the time. <laughs> so I'll just, uh, you just let me know when my time has run out. I'll try to squint, but even with squinting, I can't really see anymore. All right, well this morning, Thank you for reading from that passage of scripture as well, Ron. This morning, I would like to speak on the essence of Christianity. Taking away all of the frills and the wonderful <coughs> packaging, what is the essence of Christianity? If that question was to be posed to you at this moment in time, as it is, what would be your reply? The essence of Christianity. Fellowship. Fellowship. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? And fellowship. Fellow believers. That's right. Fellowship is so important. But it is. What else? Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He bring forth salvation. What a great, what a great message, isn't it? A great, a great message. Anyone else? You must be born again. You must be born again. That's right. Isn't that what Jesus said to Nicodemus? You must be born from again or from above. That's right. Living for the presence of the Lord. Living for the presence of the Lord, did you say, Marcy? Yeah, with the presence of the Lord. With the presence of the Lord. Amen. Forgiveness, charity. Forgiveness, charity. <coughs> Amen. Any other replies? They're all good. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Amen. Colossians chapter 1. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Amen. Love. Pardon? Love. Love. Amen. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what uh, 1 Corinthians 13? They say 13. Uh, yeah. Number 13 is an unlucky number or something. Well, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. 
What are the three that remain? Love. Hope, faith, faith, hope, and love. love. But the greatest of these is love. love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Peace. Love. Peace. Love. Peace. Love. Peace. Love. Peace. Amen. Being justified by faith, we have peace, peace with God. Know that we don't have to run and hide from God as Adam and Eve did during the fall or after the fall. There's no peace there, was there? There's just running and hiding and shame. Ah, know that Christ is our peace. Others, these are all key answers. This is, a, this is a message in itself. Compassion. Compassion. Amen. Everybody needs compassion too, right? You know, as I listen to these these responses, it doesn't sound like judgment to me. Mm -hmm. That's, those are words of, of mercy. Those are words that would, would engage and entice the hardest of hearts. Mm -hmm. These are all positive words. The gospel. Well, I have uh, I have one more term that uh, we need to consider here. In, uh, 19, in 2009, not quite yet, in 2009, <laughs> in January, um, the number one search term on Google, on Google for a short time in January with over 92 million hits basically was the essence of Christianity in a nutshell. Let, I'll let Tim Tebow take care of that. And it's sort of the essence of Christianity, so I thought, when people say, hey, what's that verse? They look at this one, uh, you know, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll see it, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, some people look at it who might not. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. See that under his eyes? What is that? Tim, Tim Tebow won the Heisman Trophy as a junior uh, in college football. And he would put that under his eyes, that black mark. Oftentimes he had Philippians 14, 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But for that big game, the final bowl game, he, and in which the team won, he put uh, uh, John 3, 16. And of course that brought tremendous, all of the uh, media encamped him, encircled him, and he, one of them uh, asked him to quote it. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, following that game, and uh, uh, for a little while, that, was, that, that verse was the most hit, uh, just even sight, on, uh, on Google. Tim Tebow, he grew up in a missionary home. He's, a, he's, a, he's an MK. He was homeschooled. And his mother asked, uh, he, was, he played for Florida State. His mother asked if he could play for the, the football team, the high school football team, even though he was homeschooled. And he had that opportunity. And uh, you see, since then, there was so much complaining that they've, they've introduced the Tebow rule that says that you can no longer put stuff under your eyes. Uh, but he's got, he has a new way of doing it. Now he puts something on his wristbands. And uh, he's, he's drafted by Denver. He plays for Denver now uh, in the NFL. So you can pray for him. What a, what a real strong uh, believer. And to think that 92 million uh, people uh, checked out that site. Uh, that is the gospel in a nutshell, mm -hmm. isn't it? The essence of Christianity. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'd like to share a few thoughts on that passage of Scripture, specifically uh, John 3, 16, and breaking it down a little. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to John 3, 16? As we consider uh, the essence of Christianity,
You know, I, as I was thinking of this message and wanting to speak on God's love, I thought, boy, I'm not going to do it justice. I, I know I can't do God's love. I can't do justice to how great God's love is. We can sing about it, and we can read about it, but even to go a step further, God wants us to know it. God wants us to know it in our hearts. His love. And the Apostle Paul even prayed in Ephesians chapter 3 that the, the believers would know the height and the depth uh, and the width and the breadth of God's love in increasing measure. And so my heart's desire for each of us here this morning is that no matter where we're at, no matter where you're at in your life, this is just about knowing God's love. And having God's love make an impact upon our lives and to change us. That's all. Nothing else. No, no words of criticism. No words of judgment. No words of rules and regulations. Just knowing the love of God. And that's my heart's desire here this morning. That we would know God's love in ever increasing measure. And so this morning as we consider the love of God and that verse. For God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son. First of all, I see in this passage of scripture and this great gospel message that it begins with God. He is the greatest one. If we can break down this verse, I see that God is the greatest one. So love is the greatest degree. The, the world is the greatest number. That he gave the greatest act. His only begotten son, the greatest gift. That whosoever, the greatest invitation, believeth the greatest simplicity, in him the greatest person, should not perish the greatest deliverance, but the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, and finally everlasting <coughs> life, the greatest possession. So we can break down John 3.16 to that degree. So as you can see, I mentioned 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. 12 points. So if I, do, if I give 2 minutes to each point, that's 24 minutes. Is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Let me see. I can see the light shining in that. Okay. The greatest one. God. It's assumed and understood. The, it originates with God, this love. God never defends himself in the scriptures. This, the ex existence of God is taken for granted. It isn't something that uh, we debate about and preoccupy with from a biblical perspective, from God's perspective. For God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son. This love begins with God. I believe in God because this. <coughs> Atheism cannot explain morality. Atheism. If there is no God, there is no moral law. No moral giver, no morals. Isn't that, wouldn't that be, really be the case? Where does the sense of right and wrong come from? That in itself proves that God exists. We get morality from God. We think what is right and what is wrong. Every, every culture has its own custom and own ideas and own laws. Some are based upon biblical principles and other cultures, they still have laws, but they're based upon laws that are opposite and opposed to the biblical truth and principles. But every culture, every person operates by a set of moral laws. If there were none, you think of what kind of state we would be in. But morality itself, if we go back to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, following the flood, we see that God is the one that institutes human government and gives Noah laws that they should live by. Morality. That if somebody is to take one person's life, as it says in Genesis, Genesis chapter 9, look what it says in this verse, that their life should be taken 
but where, where is, who implements that? But you must, as it says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. Moral, true, true biblical morality is understanding where morals come from in the first place. It comes from God. So if we take God out of the equation, we take morality out of the equation, and that's why we're in the state we're in as a society. I believe in God because atheism cannot explain life. Life came from God. Because God does not argue for his existence when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you don't see God going into a four or five point argument as to why it exists like that. But it's just simply said, and God created. Life came from God, or it did not come from God. It's one or the other. And science has yet to record an instance where life of any kind came from inanimate matter. It's impossible. It cannot be proved from a scientific perspective, an objective scientific perspective. So atheism cannot explain life. I believe in God because atheism cannot explain the universe. The simplicity of every effect has an adequate cause. Isn't that true? Every effect. If you look at a toy, that tells you that there must be a toy maker. If you look at a shoe, that tells you that there must be a shoe maker. If it tells you <laughs> that you, when you have a watch, and I don't, but a watchmaker, <laughs> it tells you that there must be a watchmaker behind that watch. The house. There must be a house builder. Why is it that all of a sudden when it comes to the universe, it just happened out of nothing? <laughs> Everything in life, in this world, teaches us cause and effect. A simple principle. And for man, mankind, there must be a creator who made us. We just didn't fall out of the sky from nothing unless God smoked. And I'm a, I believe in God because an agnostic is one who says, can't know. That in itself is an, is an admission that maybe you can know. But an agnostic just leaves it there with, I don't really want to know. Might be true, might not, but I really don't want to know because I'm too busy in my life. The greatest search of all is to, as we consider this passage of Scripture, know the love of God. You can't know the love of God if you, if you, don't, if you reject God and don't believe in Him. So I believe in God. It starts with that John 3.16. For God, if we consider this passage of Scripture, the greatest one, so love, the greatest degree, so love. As we consider this so important, this such an important statement, love. The Bible says two things about love, that in John, 1 John 4, 7, love comes from God. And in 1 John 4, 8, it says God is love. So love, true love, comes from God, and that to describe God in one word, God is love. We know that that's true. God's word describes Him. In Him there is no darkness. He is holy. There's no sin, no evil. He is love. God is love, and that word is an agape love, an unconditional love. No strings attached. It's perfect love. And love is what God is. And so this morning, I do want us to consider the God of the Bible, who is love. And this morning, as we consider 
God's love, it says this in John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Mm. So we know that God, love comes from God. God is love. And the perfect act of love is that God, no, there's no greater love than the love in which one lays down his life for his friends. And isn't that what, what Jesus did for us? As we think of his great love. But I want to look at three facets of God's love this morning. Three ways in which we see God's love. Because God's love, how can we understand unconditional? I just said it was unconditional. There's no strings attached. It's just given. Jesus came, in, came down to earth. And he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the many. Okay. Well, that's a good place to start. But there's, there's three terms that I would like to use that would help us to understand God's love. And we would have to turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Because in this, it's, a, it's three parables, but in these three parables, it describes God's love. We know this. This is referred to, I.H. Marshall has referred to this as uh, the gospel to the outcasts. That's you. That's me. The gospel to the outcasts. Because if we look at the first couple of verses of Luke chapter 15, we see it's important to get the context when reading the Bible. And in this context, there's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then there's the sinners and tax collectors. So the, it help, when the, Jesus provides these parables, let us not forget the context, the tax collectors and sinners. That's you and me. We're all gathered around to him, here, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. And of course, the first parable is what? The parable of the lost sheep. And of course, there's 99 sheep that are staying together in the pen, but one goes off, or wherever they are grazing, but one goes off on its own way and is lost. And what happened? What does the shepherd do? He goes after the one that is lost. And he, he, doesn't, he doesn't give up until he finds it. And he goes after that sheep. And he keeps looking for that sheep, does the shepherd. In fact, he calls his friends and his neighbors together when he finds that sheep. And he rejoices. And then he says this, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Well, as we study the Bible, who are the 99 that don't need to repent? <laughs> they don't exist. But in the Pharisees and Sadducees' mind, they did exist. It was them. Jesus was pointing to them in this parable. He wasn't just going after the lost sheep, the sinners and the tax collectors. He was to see how much he lost them. But he was also making a message to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You maybe don't think you need to repent, but you do. But I'm going to go after the one that's really lost and find him and seek him and bring him back. And so this, this parable teaches God's love, but it teaches something specifically about God's love. It teaches his faithfulness. God is faithful. The Lord's love and compassion never fails. Great is his Faithfulness. His love is faithful. As God is searching the earth still, that the Holy Spirit and the hound of heaven is seeking for the hearts and fighting and battling and convicting the hearts of humanity. And for those that maybe we've forgotten about, maybe in our own families, that we feel as though are beyond our help and our hope, we've given up hope. God is still seeking him out. The lost, the sinners. He's faithful. He's given.
given us this day, proving that he's faithful to us. And that it's one more opportunity, one more day, for the lost and the sinners to turn to the Lord. It's teaching us his faithfulness. There was 99, but yet he saw one lost. How faithful is our God? God's love is this... This is the gospel to the outcast. And John 3.16 is the gospel to the outcast. But as well we see in this next parable, or excuse me, yes, the next parable. Yep. The parable of the lost coin, beginning in verse 8. We see a woman who has ten silver coins and loses one. Does not she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Mm -hmm. I remember once I was driving taxi, and it was at night time, and I thought, oh, I, well, I couldn't find my wallet. And I thought, oh, no, I've lost my wallet or someone stole it. So I kept on driving while I was looking for my wallet. I don't suggest that. <laughs> That does show us how important money is. <laughs> and sure enough, I'm, sure I'm looking, looking, bang! Yep, the car in front of me had stopped. I was anticipating it would just keep going. But that was just another accident that cabbie number 87 had. <laughs> back in another life. <laughs> I'm not going to other details of going to work. Part of the reason why I got into that accident. But you know, I was searching for that wallet everywhere. You know, this woman here, this, this parable of the lost coin, she was searching everywhere. And she was sweeping everywhere the house and searching it carefully, trying to find that. But with what does what kind of desire did she have and exemplify in this search? I see the fervency. I see the fervency of this woman and a desire to find that coin. And you know, as we think of God's love, God's love is not indifferent towards the world. God's love is seeking. He's searching. There's fervency in that desire of the Lord, not for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance and tr trust in Christ Jesus and faith in Christ Jesus. There's a fervency there. Sometimes in our churches, I wish we had that same fervency. I wish I had that same fervency. <coughs> because I know the Holy Spirit wants me to have that fervency for the lost. <coughs> to be praying, to be helping in any way possible. When we think of eternity, oh, the thoroughness of the search is what's important in this second parable. And it was a thorough search because it was a fervent search. And finally, in this third parable, the most exhaustive parable of the three, in the lost and found department, we see here the two sons, and without reading every verse, we know the younger son says, give me my portion while the father is still alive. Give me my portion of the inheritance. The father gives it to him, and the son goes away to a far country where he spends all that money. All that dough, he wasted. And that's what the word prodigals means, isn't it? Wasteful. And so that's what he does. He lives out the name in his character and in his actions. And so as we see the son there in that faraway country, where once he spends all of his money and all of his friends are gone, he is no one. He realizes the plight of his situation and it's his own doing. And then we see what he says. When he, verse 19, he says, I am no long, longer worthy to be called your son. As he's thinking to himself what he can say to his father. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father when he was in that faraway country. A few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a musical concert. I was listening to my main man, Toby Mac. Uh, that was good. He did some of that body surfing. Right on. 
Um, and then he gave a message, and I don't want to debate my main man Toby Mac on this point, but he had said that wherever you are, and I appreciated the message and the testimony, wherever you are, turn around and God will meet you there. And to a degree, he was talking about repentance. And to a degree, I do believe repentance starts with changing your mind toward God. Not against God, but toward God. But I don't really believe it ends there. That the true believer will continue on. John the Baptist, when he was baptizing and people were coming into the water, gee, John the Baptist said, show fruit with your repentance. Mm -hmm. In other words, just don't go through the water and uh, you're not realizing what, we're, what I'm talking about here. It says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. There should be a change of heart and mind in my perception of God and who he is. And under, once I understand that Jesus has died on the cross for me, he saved me. But then the, the next step is once I've made that acknowledgement and trust, there needs to be that fruit of repentance. Seeking the Lord and going after him. To please him with my life. Mm -hmm. Though I may fall seven times in one day, the Lord picks me up seven times. We also need to remember that important part of the gospel message. It's a changed heart. It's a changed life. And that we would bring forth fruit of repentance in our lives. But you see, when we see, because we see the son, he just didn't stay where he was in a faraway country when he realized he needed to change and how good it was in the father's life. He started the long journey back. Thought of a message the long and winding road. Mm. Mm. Somebody said the song. Anyways, the long and winding road. You know that's the true fruit of repentance. A long life journey. Sometimes we go through hard times. Sometimes we get dusted up ourselves. But we're still pursuing, going towards the Father, seeking to please Him with our lives. When was the, you know, of course there would be the great theological debate. When was the son actually saved? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I knew he, he, he could demonstrate <coughs> proof of repentance in his walk back to the father. And the father from a long ways up sees the son. And of course he runs to the son and hugs the son and of course says, bring me the best robe and put it in puts the best robe on the sun. And he does the same with the, sh the ring and the shoes. And of course they have a great feast. But what does this show? The Father's forgiveness. Forgiveness. If the first parable speaks of God's faithfulness and His love, the second parable speaks of God's fervency in His love. And the third parable speaks of God's forgiveness. You know what? Forgiveness alone can halt the cycle of blame and pain. Forgiveness alone. Nothing else. A changed heart and mind. We turn toward God and we realize what God has done for us and He can change us. Forgiveness offers a way out. The prodigal son had a way out, going back home, going back home. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful message for you and I? Going back home, a way out. Not, not escaping, not running, not hiding. But God provides a way out in which his love changes our lives. In the days when the greatest evangelist Moody was preaching in Chicago, a man, partially under the influence of liquor, seeing the warm lights of Moody's tabernacle, staggered up the steps to the front door. Upon opening it, he saw no one within, but he did see the motto hanging above the pulpit, God is love. The man slammed the door, staggered down the steps, and muttered to himself, God is love. 
God is not love. If God were love, He would love me, and He hates me. He continued his uneven walk around the block, still muttering to himself. But those were words began to burn images into his benumbed thinking. A power seemed to draw him back to the tabernacle. With the throngs that were now making their way into the tabernacle or the sanctuary, he soon found himself seated inside, and Mr. Moody was preaching. The sermon over, Moody made his way to the door to shake hands with the people as they left. But this man didn't leave. He continued to sit in his seat, weeping. Moody came over to him, put his arm over the man's shoulder and asked, is there something that I could do for you? What was in my sermon that touched your heart? Oh, Mr. Moody, I didn't hear a word that you spoke tonight. And the man responded, it's those words up there over your pulpit. God is love. Moody sat down and talked with him for a while, and soon he gave his heart to Moody's God. Moody's God. Friends, God is love. And that's what changes our heart. That's what melts our hearts. Nothing else can. All the rules and the regulations, all the Christianization that, and the words that we use and the fancy words, that won't change us from here. Only God's love will. Mm -hmm. And this morning, my message, that I, the best that I can do is say that God loves you and me as only He can. And He can change our lives from within. I trust this morning that you desire to know the height and the depth and the width of His love this morning and pursue it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. And you would know, Lord, in my own life, how easily it is to be called toward your love. How difficult it is to even communicate your love as I ought to. Lord, in my own life, teach me to know your love more every day. And for each one here, that would be our heart's desire. There's no greater message to know and to truly apprehend the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus. Thank you for each one here. And for our time together, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.